Does manual treasury management and operations have your crypto business stuck in the slow lane? Scale up and speed ahead with Fireblocks, the number one platform for crypto operations and trading pros that makes custody, settlement, and rebalancing quick and easy. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all of their crypto assets in one place. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com prime to get started today. Eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust, Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block, and we have a very exciting episode for you today. Joining us on the other side of the mic is Dave Olson, President of Jump Trading. Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show. Frank, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. It really is uh, great that you were able to come on, despite some of our technology challenges that we had uh, before we, we got linked up. But... I want to take a unique approach to starting the show. So often I have folks from your world, the market making, HFT, trading world, quant trading world come on and we talk about the trends shaping the market, what they're seeing out there, more so the the what rather than the the how per se. We had a, a hedge fund guy come on the show last episode. And we took a unique approach where we kind of talked about exactly how the job works. What's the decision-making process behind going directionally long or directionally short? I thought it'd be pretty cool before we jump into some other topics to kind of just walk the listener through what exactly a market-making firm does in crypto and beyond. I like to explain it as kind of similar to how we might think of Amazon, right? Sitting between the merchants and people who are willing to buy, sometimes they hold on to that inventory. In a similar way, a trading firm like Jump does something pretty similar, right? Kind of sitting between buyers and sellers, and in some cases taking on risks, but operating within a very short time frame. But since you're the expert and I'm not, maybe you can kind of walk us through how that works. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the role of a market maker in any product, you know, whether that's a physical product, uh, you know, your Amazon analogy, I think, is a good one. Uh, you could think of a car dealership, uh, you know, amassing inventory and trying to know the value of the, the car and waiting for someone to buy on the offered side. But there are really two key components to being able to, to provide liquidity into a market. Um, one is the existence of bid offer. So uh, with enough volume, if you buy low uh, and sell high over and over and over. Uh, that's a that's a business model that works, obviously. Um, and the the trick is uh, being able to be able to buy at the right time and hold the position with the expectation that someone else is going to want to purchase it at, uh, at a slightly higher price. You don't always get that right, uh, but the existence of bid offer and the ability to be more competitive uh, or provide a tighter bid offer than the rest of the market uh, is something that if you can accomplish it is going to bring flow. Uh, the other is the ability to uh, have a view, a correct view, hopefully, on the direction of the price of the asset that you're providing liquidity on. Uh, so let's say you've got an instrument that is bid at a price of four and offered at a price of five in the market. If you can bid four and a quarter, four and three quarters, you're going to be the best price for someone who's selling and the best price for someone who's buying. Um, 
that's terrific. Mm -hmm. But if you have a view based on uh, all the information that you've got available to you at that moment, uh, that the price is on its way from a midpoint of four and a half, using my example, up to six, you might bid at four and a half or even four and three quarters, or even lift the offer at five yourself uh, and bet that the, the price is going to end up at six, where you can either have someone lift you out of your position or cross the bid offer at that point and sell to somebody at, I don't know, five and a half. So those two components are really at the core of any market maker's uh, operation. Uh, and the, the art of it is making sure that you've got all the data and the ability to analyze it uh, and to, uh, to act on it in a way that, you know, at least 51% of the time makes money. Yeah, it's all about scale to an extent. In crypto and in equities, is the name of the game just trying to get as wide of a spread as possible? Is that the profit opportunity there? Well, I think that our philosophy is uh, we look at markets that we have an opportunity to, uh, to trade in reasonable volume and where we can bring additional efficiency to that market. Efficiency, either because the bid offer is too wide to begin with, and we can compress that mm. so that everybody gets a better price and we can earn a living in the meantime. Or efficiency that information, uh, maybe from another market, uh, maybe from a, a similar asset, uh, is not being incorporated into the price effectively for that market. So I think in either case, uh, you know, if you get it right, not only can we earn enough to keep doing it and keep making those investments, but the end user in that market is going to get a better price, either in terms of lower bid ask spread or a better reflection of all the information in the world that should be incorporated into the value of that asset. Um, so those are the those are the two kind of key variables that we try to bring to any market where we do business. And there's more liquidity there. So if I wanted to move in size, put on a large position with firms like Jump sitting in the background, it's easier for me to do that. One question that I have is, okay, so what exactly goes into the process of either tightening those spreads for the other market participants out there and having the data or the know-how to get into the market in a specific way. What are the tools in your toolbox, so to speak, that can effectively make you a good market maker? You know, it's an incredibly competitive environment. It's one of the most competitive areas of finance. Uh, there are a lot of smart, well-capitalized firms that are all competing to, you know, be that price provider to, to be a slightly better bid or a slightly cheaper offer uh, than anybody else on the planet. Um, and there have been, uh, there have been a lot of repetitions and a lot of... There's been a lot of shakeouts too. A lot of shakeouts and a, and a, and a lot of opportunity to, to learn. And it's gotten to a state of the art that really is both quite efficient and and quite sophisticated. But the the core elements that you need, you need to have access to multiple markets simultaneously. Frank, you brought up a very good point that if someone wants to move size, they're now able to move size maybe in in an amount that is above the capacity of the market that they're dealing in, because you've got participants, some participants like us, that have access to a lot of markets simultaneously. So we can stay on that bid and keep getting hit, even though the, the marketplace or the exchange or the venue where they're trading at that moment might not have the liquidity to support it. We're, we can channel all of that selling pressure and diffuse it globally to a number of other venues. So the first thing you need is you need, you need connectivity at scale. So you've got to be involved and connected to and able to trade uh, pretty much everywhere where that instrument trades. Uh, you also need plenty of capital. Uh, so a lot of markets, especially crypto, uh, there might be leverage available to you in some areas, but for the most part, crypto is a fully funded, pre-funded game where you know it's great if you're getting hit on Coinbase and you want to sell somewhere else, 
but you've got to have coins pre-staged at those other venues ready to go uh, or cash pre-staged fiat or stable coins pre-staged where you can be the buyer. And so you've got a multiplier effect on your capital base to have to really be all places at once. So connectivity, scale, and then the ability to analyze all the information you're getting and translate that into your best prediction of what should the price be for that asset at that moment in time. Uh, those are really the three building blocks. I'm going to get into crypto. I hope the crypto native listeners aren't sort of getting a little too lost in the weeds here. We're going to talk about Jump's role in the crypto market. We're going to talk about Wormhole, but I just want to continue on this thread because I think it's interesting and important context. So when most people think about connectivity, right, they think of I'm not going to say his name, but that book written by that guy about that one exchange, right? And putting your sort of um, co-locating your trading systems with the exchange data systems. That's not so much. Well, we are getting into crypto, actually. That's not so much the name of the game in crypto, is it? Maybe juxtapose what's important as a market maker trading firm in crypto versus equities, right? Because co-location isn't necessarily something that's important. Yeah, I, you know, and I was using connectivity more in in terms of having access to participate in the market and the ability to get data out of it, rather than you know the specific means through which you're uh, you're connecting. So the ability to trade on a venue, no matter where that venue is in the world, is really the key component that you need. I think that the you know in traditional market making or in crypto, speed is one of the most uninteresting features of the marketplace. Uh, it's really capacity and the ability to analyze the data and develop a, a prediction of the current price and where the price is moving that really trump it. You can't be slow. You can't have a dial-up internet connection and, and expect to participate uh, uh, with any success. But there's really no payoff to being, uh, to being faster than anyone else. That hasn't always been true, but the state of the markets today, uh, it if you're relying on speed alone to make money, you've got a very fragile business model that is not going to survive for long. And that's the case in equities, but you're saying it's even more so the case in, in crypto. Speed is far less important, even when can juxtapose with equities. It, yeah, the, the crypto market is less deterministic than mm -hmm. other financial markets. And what I mean by that is you get different behavior if you try to do the same thing over and over. A lot of the traditional finance marketplaces have dialed up the precision of their matching engines and their cable lengths and all that sort of thing so that if you did a thousand trades, you've got an extremely tight distribution on what happens every single time. A lot of the crypto market is cloud hosted. Uh, it is, it's gone through le fewer cycles of development from an infrastructure standpoint and weird things still happen. You know, you, uh, uh, you send an order, you cancel that order, you get an acknowledgement back that your order's been canceled. And then a little while later, you get a fill on that same order. And you're like, well, wait a minute, both of those things can't be true. What's going on? So you've got to untangle a, a pretty messy data environment and it doesn't have the si same hyper precision that an equity venue or a futures venue might have in uh, in other areas, that's gonna you know that's gonna change over time as these platforms mature. But it's uh, it, it is a different animal right now. What about the relationship between trading firms like Jump and venues in crypto? I know from my experience in traditional capital markets. In fact, there was a gentleman I used to work with at Nasdaq who used to who used to say that the trading firms get the steak and potatoes and they leave us with the salt. So they're they're not always. You know, they're obviously collaborative in, in so far as we're one capital market, but there are sometimes tensions and, and the trading firms and exchanges often go head to head on things like data feed costs and other things. In crypto, I feel like it's a little bit of a different animal, right? The exchanges depend on the market makers a bit more for a number of different things, not just liquidity, but sort of investment advice, guidance on building out these systems, right? Because maybe, well, not so much the case today, but at least a few years ago, they really needed you guys to come in to stabilize things and whether it's dampen volatility or sort of serve as a backstop. Do you guys have a bit more of an upper hand, so to speak, or is it a bit more um, friendly? 
or um, congenial than maybe in equities? You know, I'd say that crypto in general has definitely more of a community vibe uh, than any other marketplace or any other asset class. But I think that it is a little bit different in that most most of the focus over the last decade or so in crypto has been on the end user consumer or the prosumer. And it's not an it's not a market that started at an institutional level and then went downstream to the retail investor. It really started with retail enthusiasts. And if you look at the way that exchanges and platforms in crypto that service the market developed and still are structured, it really does center on the you know two-legged individual end user who has an account and has interest in the GUI and, and wants to have trading analytics designed for them. And the institutional participant or the market making participant is not really the key focus. Uh, so we've got productive, collaborative relationships with uh, pretty much every venue out there, uh, given our given our role in the market. But um, I would say that their focus on you know market structure or tuning their matching engines or things like that uh, it's it's less front of mind than it would be in TradFi, where uh, you know the institutional marketplace is the uh, is kind of the the body of the dog and and retail might be the tail uh, you know for example in derivatives markets or something like that where sure. uh, there's very little retail participation so i i'd say most of these venues are you know their priorities are how do we do a better job servicing the end user uh, and gaining customers and gaining share and things like that and uh, and we're kind of you know we're not back of the line but we're not uh, uh, we're not you know dealing with a lot of influence either way Fair enough. I I feel like the community aspect of the crypto market helped drag jump from out of the proverbial shadows, so to speak. You guys have a history of being very behind the scenes, very much a quiet firm. What about crypto? Community is clearly one pillar of, of what brought you out. But what about the market specifically? Force jump to kind of be more public. You guys have a podcast now, I'm pretty sure. Good setup equipment there that I see. I never would have thought covering jump six years ago when I when I broke that Steve Hunt was leaving the firm that they would ever have anything close to a podcast, let alone go on podcast. So what about crypto really changed that? Yeah, you know, it was never our philosophy as a company to be a secretive organization. Uh, it, there was just never a, a need or an opportunity to be very public. Uh, we're not a fund. We don't have investors. We're not managing third-party money. We don't have assets under custody for clients. We don't produce, you know, earnings reports for uh, for equity holders or anything like that. We just, you know... Uh, Put down our lunch pails and got to work, and you know, and then uh, and then went home. Uh, it was it was the culture of the place that uh, not a lot of egomaniacs. Yeah, if if you didn't need to, you know, uh, talk about stuff, you, you just you just got to work. I I think the difference in crypto really is that uh, although our roots are in trading, uh, we became much more active in investing in parts of infrastructure and projects that we were excited about, uh, and then really expanded into trying to become builders ourselves and bring on a lot of blockchain engineering talent and, uh, and position ourselves so that we could help these communities expand in a way that we thought was helpful. Uh, and it was really that, that, uh, you know, you need to talk about things and sometimes you need to rally support or have healthy debates or be a little bit more in the public eye. So it's really that evolution that kind of brought us to this fancy mic setup that I'm speaking through right now. <laughs> well, I think the wormhole incident speaks to the degree to which the firm has become pretty transparent, right? I mean, when it happened and people were speculating about who would be footing the bill, who would be covering it, I was getting inundated with DMs from people asking me if jump would sort of jump to the <laughs> jump to the table there to take care of it and i was interested to see if you guys would confirm or deny it and you came out and you said that, you know we're going to 
cover the ETH that was lost. I think it was about $320 million and came out and said it. So that, that I think shows just how transparent you guys are trying to be. But maybe we can now talk about that sort of incident. It, it, it speaks to a lot of different themes that we've talked about already. This sort of more open nature of the firm, the way in which you guys are trying to be builders more so than traders to an extent. So there's kind of two key themes there in this news event, but maybe you can walk through what exactly happened, what your assessment of the wormhole hack is, and whether some of those cracks have been papered up or filled up rather. Uh, Yeah, for sure. So uh, for those listeners that might not be totally familiar, uh, wormhole is a a DeFi capability that allows for cross-chain compatibility. Uh, It's a bridge for assets, for messages, for NFTs, uh, for tokens, uh, so that something that's happening on one layer one blockchain can be replicated and live in an environment on another layer one blockchain. Uh, There are now seven primary layer ones that are interoperable on Wormhole. And if you, you know, for example, uh, are an artist that wanted to mint uh, a series of NFTs, but you found either the cost or the energy footprint of doing so on the Ethereum blockchain to be prohibitive, uh, you could mint those NFTs on Solana and then choose a subset or, or transfer that NFT through Wormhole into a NFT marketplace on on the Ethereum blockchain. So uh, a lot of traffic uh, between blockchains, uh, a lot of total value locked, over two billion now uh, on the on the wormhole network. And in our view, this kind of cross chain capability is integral to the the development of a really fertile, really healthy ecosystem in crypto going forward. So. A lot of conviction about the project, uh, a lot of excitement about the composability that's already happening on top of Wormhole and a cross-chain kind of a a structure. Uh, And it was with that context that we went into uh, the events a couple of weeks ago uh, when a vulnerability was exploited and ETH was stolen uh, by thieves. So... Uh, you know, to, to kind of take you back uh, to that moment, many of us with Jump Crypto were at an offsite exercise that we were having in South Florida. Uh, there were at least a couple dozen of us down there. We were digging deep into some research projects and and formulating strategy around platforms and, you know, discussing the business just internally. We were in the middle of one of these conversations when one of the developers who's closely focused on Wormhole noticed a unusual discrepancy in the amount of wrapped ETH relative to the amount that had been locked on the Ethereum blockchain uh, and kind of sounded the alarm. Very quickly, we had uh, a cross-functional team congregating on uh, real-time communication channels and went about trying to diagnose, okay, what is happening? (laughs) How did it happen? How big is the problem? How do we stop it from getting bigger? And you know, one of the one of the realities of a decentralized capability is, unlike if you know something goes wrong inside your own building, there's no big red button to press to take the thing offline. There are 19 independent guardians. You can't unplug wormhole. <laughs> you have to go. You, you know, you have to go around and get alert each of the guardians and make sure they know what's happening and. Uh, the system was taken down safely for the diagnosing of the problem and and ultimately repairing it. We got our arms around the fact pretty quickly that 120,000 ETH had been uh, had been compromised, had been stolen. It was clear what the vulnerability was after that diagnostic work took place, and that we could develop a patch uh, working in j- conjunction with other teams and auditing firms and making sure that we were trying to think of every edge case that, you know, solving one problem, you don't want to create another. We took that extremely seriously, but had consensus confidence that the the identification of the vulnerability and the fix was robust 
Uh, we rolled that out to the guardians and the nodes and then safely restarted, uh, restarted the network the next morning. In parallel, of course, is the question, uh, all right, well, what happens to the compromised ETH? Uh, and the, the value that was backed in the system for people that were holding wrapped ETH or depended upon that uh, uh, value being there. And we made the decision with our money alone, this was not a syndicate or a, a group of folks that got together to pool resources to, uh, to go out and purchase 120,000 ETH and, and put it back in. Um, we did debate that, but what, what led to such a swift conclusion uh, was, was what we felt was that we would have a bigger impact on the community by immediately being able to tell everybody that their assets were backed one to one and step up and and kind of lead the community with the investment of uh, of that eth into the into the project. So start to finish, uh, I think that the around an hour and a half to from decision point to having acquired uh, all the eth and staging it in a wallet for it to go into the into the platform, and then the public announcements followed after that. And so that was all just ETH you had sitting on your balance sheet. You didn't finance a portion of it, or what was the? What it's was a the good structure? question. So uh, it, rather than ETH sitting on our balance sheet uh, ahead of time, it was uh, we went out and bought the ETH in the open market wow. uh, after the hack with uh, you know uh, cash assets that we had on our balance sheet. Made those purchases, you know, using our global network of of trading capability bought it and then and then transferred it in. Uh, but there was no loan, there was no uh, extension of credit or uh, collateralized uh, assets put up in order to to get it from someone else or um, anything like that. It was a it's probably not even jump's biggest trade. <laughs> we had the cash, we spent the cash, we got the eth, uh, we put it uh, we put it to work. Did you get a good price? You know, um, the the market was pretty stable, thankfully. Um, we were able to buy it without a lot of price impact, uh, and we were prioritizing speed over precision. It's not like we were out there just trying to get hit on attractive bids and accumulate it in a in a drip feed kind of fashion. We were uh, we were in go mode, uh, and the market was. Uh, was deep and and pretty stable uh, throughout the entire time that we were in there. Sanguine and lots of liquidity. What more could you have asked for in that moment of time? Yeah, right. Having trouble keeping pace with the crypto boom? When your business is scaling up and your portfolio is growing, you don't want to waste precious time on manual treasury management or settling and rebalancing. Fireblocks can handle that for you with smart, scalable solutions for your crypto business, along with industry leading security and expertise. They'll take care of the back end so you can focus on the big picture. Visit fireblocks.com to learn more. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, an integrated solution that provides institutional investors with an advanced trading platform, secure custody, and prime services to manage all their crypto assets in one place. Coinbase Prime fully integrates crypto trading and custody on a single platform and gives clients the best all-in pricing in their network using their proprietary smart order router and algorithmic execution. Futuristic companies like Tesla and MicroStrategy have already used Coinbase's comprehensive investing platform to execute some of the largest trades in the industry. Build a unified investment portfolio with one of the most trusted names in crypto. Learn more by visiting coinbase.com slash prime to get started today. Are you eager to make more informed decisions around crypto using data you can trust? Chainalysis is here to help. Chainalysis demystifies cryptocurrency by providing industry-leading compliance, market intelligence, and investigation support for all crypto assets for organizations like Gemini, Crypto.com, and BlockFi. Gain unparalleled visibility and maximize your potential with the leading blockchain data platform by visiting Chainalysis.com now. 
So that's pretty interesting. I want to get a sense of like your prognosis for what happened in a AMA that Solana founder Anatoly hosted. He kind of chalked up the incident to a lack of tooling within the Solana community, at least at the time of Wormhole's development. We have some of that tooling now. Thinking of things like Soteria, which is a sort of security service for Solana. How would you describe your prognosis for what happened? Was it a lack of tooling or something else? You know, there was a uh, there was a vulnerability that uh, was identified by what we believe to be a very sophisticated a, a, an attacker that had the capability to really understand uh, code from every direction in a way that had eluded who we believe are the best security blockchain engineers in the world and a couple of the uh, the best resourced, most expert blockchain auditing firms that had reviewed the code and not seen this vulnerability. So it was not low-hanging fruit. This was not uh, you know, an obvious error, but a bug did exist in the code base. Uh, and this, uh, this attacker was able to identify it and exploit it. So I think that the, the security environment we know is highly visible. Uh, anytime you start getting total value locked that are at these kind of numbers, you have a target on you. Uh, and I think that this was a, a difficult, but ultimately a moment where the, the code base got more robust. It was costly uh, to go through that iteration. Uh, but we're coming out the other side stronger, and I think the you know the bug bounty that is out there to try to identify anything else that is overlooked is, as far as we know, the highest that has ever been offered. It's a ten million dollar bug bounty. Uh, we've got a lot of eyes on it, and uh, both uh, within the wormhole project at Jump Crypto, at auditing firms, uh, looking at ways to make it safer. Well, I think that the speed behind your execution to solve this problem is pretty impressive. And it's it's really cool to kind of get that background and that the story behind the execution on fixing this. I wonder though, obviously Solana has kind of had a bunch of issues um, related to its uptime, the, the wormhole hack being another recent example. Does this chip away at the thesis that Solana can one day be the blockchain for Wall Street. If there are all these incidences with downtime, can you envision a future where Jump is potentially conducting most of its trading activity on Solana and other trading firms? Yeah, I, I think that the the maturity arc that we're watching Solana go through is not too different than a lot of other explosively popular protocols in, in Web 1, Web 2, and, and now Web 3. Uh, you've got immediate scale. Uh, oftentimes, immediate scale comes with illumination of elements that need to be enhanced. Those enhancements get made and, uh, and things take off from there. I think, you know, the a lot of people talked about the QR code ad in the Super Bowl that that Coinbase launched. I know that they would have done uh, incredible load testing and you know thinking about how many eyeballs are looking at that. You know they had a they had a blip where the system went down. That's usually a sign of success uh, that something you're doing is attracting that much attention and getting that many simultaneous users to do it. Uh, and I think that. You know, Solana is seeing that happen. To answer the second part of your question, we think there is a an extraordinary promise in high performance, high capacity blockchains. Uh, Solana has put a new mark out there in terms of trades per second and performance characteristics that unlock the ability to do uh, a lot of things that you only see in in traditional finance markets today. So, you know, that is uh, blurring the line between what's possible, what had been possible in crypto and what is routine in traditional finance, 
we're going to continue to see that evolve. Uh, and, you know, we could definitely see uh, those those types of capabilities being an increasingly important part of the way we access liquidity and markets globally, for sure. Has the incident forced Jump to reconsider the degree to which it's maybe over-indexed on Solana? Our very, very active VC capital markets analyst, John D'Antoni, created a pretty cool chart that shows the blockchain's ecosystem bets that you guys have made. And I think it's about 50 some odd percent Solana. Is it too much Solana? Well, I think the incident is really about a cross-chain future and uh, no single layer one Solana or anyone else uh, is uh, is integral to the vision that we see in the in the cross chain world. I think for us, the the wormhole incident and our conviction around uh, the the need to have wormhole continue to develop and continue to become uh, more capable is really so that the market can adapt to using comparative advantage of layer ones in a way that gets the best out of each protocol. So, you know, whether it's Terra or Ethereum or Oasis, you know, each of those layer ones has very specific attributes that are different than the other. So, you know, Ethereum brings an incredible community and a very vibrant smart contract and NFT world with it. O Oasis brings a capability to to share private data and do analysis and research uh, on data that never would have been shared otherwise. And the ability to, to move both data and value and tokens across those is bigger than any one of those single blockchain stories, uh, whether that's you know Ethereum or Solana or, or anything else. Are there plans for additional layer two support? Uh, with Wormhole specifically? Yeah. yeah. Its, its focus is really on uh, being a bridge and interoperability layer between layer ones, uh, but it's just it's, a, it's at very early stages, and I think that how to integrate any layer two solutions uh, in that are something that are going to be examined uh, as it continues to grow. Makes a lot of sense. I want to talk about one of the things that Jump became very well known for earlier on in its crypto journey is the engagements you guys have with students and the incubator program that you have. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the whole crypto unit was born out of a sort of college internship-like program. How has that continued to feed the development of internal projects, whether they be blockchain or otherwise? Yeah, it's a great question. And indeed, uh, you know, the very first steps we took in crypto uh, were down at the University of Illinois in a laboratory that we had set up uh, in conjunction with the computer science and computer engineering faculty there. Uh, the, the funny part of that story that doesn't get focused on that much uh, is the students that were involved in that lab uh, were so good that we started to run out of run out of projects to send down there for them to work on. You know, we had all this <laughs> high performance computing equipment down there. We made available data sets that were really interesting. It was a really fun collaborative effort, but something that we thought would take two or three weeks to get done, they were getting done in two or three days. And <laughs> I'm not going to say that our initial exploration into crypto was a, a dig a hole and fill it back up project. Uh, but we were, we were looking for things that would not expose the most sensitive intellectual property that we had at Jump and were still interesting to work on in a way that was going to be challenging. And developing, this is back 2015, 2016, developing high performance connectivity to all of the crypto venues around the world would have been an irrational economic choice for any trading company to make at that stage. It was just too early, even if you knew what the future path was going to be, it it wouldn't have been worth the spend and the time relative to other opportunities you had to do it back then. Uh, but we had this workforce uh, or this, this talent pool that was hungry and interested and motivated. Uh, and we, we, we kind of let them loose uh, and they, uh, uh, they developed this capability. 
just at the right time, like right before the real lift in Bitcoin started uh, in late 2016, early 2017, and then and then we were off to the races. So it was very cool to see that. Um, you know, a lot of lessons that we took away from that. Um, we've always had a culture that tries to identify talent early, um, bring on people that have got orthogonal skill sets, uh, people that might not have ever been involved in finance. You know, we have a lot of physicists and chemists and uh, pure research PhDs at the company that jump trading was the very first exposure they've had to finance. Uh, and just as a pure research problem, uh, the types of tools and the types of opportunities that are here uh, are have been incredibly uh, fun to work on and rewarding for uh, for those folks uh, that have that have come over. So. Uh, back to your question, though, the um, the cool thing about what's happening in crypto is, you know, there are parts of the market that didn't exist six months ago, 12 months ago, entire new product classes that nobody has a decade of experience dealing with. And so age and tenure become almost irrelevant in the face of such a fast moving uh, technology. So we've we've taken a very agnostic view about uh, about background, and there are um, you know literal teenagers that uh, have uh, have capabilities that uh, that we want to bring on board and 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 really let uh, give a very high ceiling to in in trying to solve some of these problems. It would have been a really cool experience to be a fly on the wall of University of Illinois. In, in the lab in which these young young folks were working, I, I can't imagine. I mean, back then, the exchanges were so amateurish, constantly changing their APIs. There was no uniformity. And I, I bet you, you guys probably went into it thinking it would be a somewhat Herculean challenge. And, and, you know, maybe we figure it out, but nowhere near as quickly as they managed to figure it out. And that kind of set the foundation. Yeah, no doubt. And, and the, you know, uh, you're right. The, the platforms and the matching engines were so idiosyncratic and a lot of times very creatively constructed by people that had no exposure to finance whatsoever. You know, they didn't know about the CME matching engine. They didn't know what CME stood for. They didn't care. It didn't matter. And all they saw was a liquidity problem that they wanted to solve in a novel way uh, without the interference of kind of the legacy architecture that traditional finance used. But that makes the challenge of connecting really high performance capabilities extremely difficult. Uh, and, you know, I think that the philosophy we had was, listen, if there's somebody out there that can create the gateways and interact with APIs that have been built by these crypto platforms, it's going to be no sweat to connect to BATS or the New York Stock Exchange or something like that, where everything's documented and logical <laughs> and follows a linear sequence. And, you know, you can ask people about it. So it really was a cool proving ground to, uh, to have these frontiers people go out and explore what was possible. I don't know if you saw the headline this week that New York Stock Exchange had filed some sort of trademark to create an NFT marketplace. How do you see a firm like Jump engaging with the disparate number of NFT marketplaces that are out there? Is there an opportunity to sort of sit in the background in the same way you do in equities, crypto, et cetera? Yeah, NFTs are uh, obviously scaling pretty quickly. Um, we've got resources dedicated to figuring out ways that we can help solve some of the problems out there and increase liquidity and transparency and data. They are a different animal. I mean, by definition, they're not fungible. You you can't trade the same same NFT on forty marketplaces around the world simultaneously, or see an imbalance one place and help correct that with your capital and your trading capability. Uh, so it is it is a different problem to solve, but one that we're excited to take on and have been spending a bunch of time thinking about. Makes a lot of sense. I want to be respectful of your time. I know that we're we're just we're just at time. But one thing that I think could be interesting, and I'm trying to ask more people about, is what do you look for? We, we kind of touch the, the peripheral of this question. What do you look for when you're bringing someone new into the company, you know, whether they're junior or, or more senior? Um, the talent environment right now is 
pretty intense. So I want to maybe get a sense of what you look for. Yeah, I mean, we've got a bunch of different roles, so there's no single answer to that question. Um, we've got a uh, incredible group of people at the company that are probably most motivated when we find someone that we don't that knows something that we don't know, uh, that has had some exposure or has a, a take on a hard problem, or uh, it comes from a walk of life where we don't have a lot of those people already. So getting that kind of diverse mindset uh, and orthogonal views coming to solve problems at Jump is is probably the single biggest motivator we've got when we uh, recruit and talk about candidates. Uh, uh, obviously, we have a highly technical environment and many of the folks that we uh, are attracted to have got uh, real chops in computer science, computer engineering, networking capability, pure research. Uh, so depending on the role, um, we're looking to get, uh, you know, the, the talented, motivated people that we can learn from uh, and and bring on and, and see what's going on. Super cool. And the firm has grown quite quite substantially over the past few years. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're well north of a thousand employees total. Uh, well north of a hundred just in the crypto unit. Um, so we've, uh, we've scaled up, uh, over time. Definitely. Cool. Well, sir, thank you so much for joining the show again. We've been joined by Dave Olson, president of jump trading. Dave, where can our listeners learn more about you, more about jump, maybe more about your podcast? What, what can you shill for us? They can follow Kanov's intern. That's another question. Is that really his intern? I was going to ask him when he was going to come on, but you know, I will, uh, I'll, I'll chase that down and I'll get back to you on that, Frank. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show. So yeah, where can we, where can we find you? So we've got a uh, active Twitter channel. Jump Crypto has, uh, has been, uh, pretty active recently, you know, find us on the web on Twitter. We've got, uh, a number of, of channels that you can go to and learn more about us. And, uh, you did mention our podcast. It's called the Jump off point. Uh, Kanav and I recently did an episode where we got a little bit deeper into some of the wormhole specifics. So any of those channels, we welcome the listeners to check out. Well, thanks again for stopping by. The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an amazing day.